And we're back with another episode of Resourceful Agent Radio Show. Uh, today, we've got an awesome guest for you guys, podcaster, coach, life coach, previous uh, principal for a school, right? Yeah, that's right. So why don't you tell everyone your name and what you do? My name is Paul Casey, and I own a business called Growing Forward Services. And uh, my, my mission is to equip and coach leaders and their teams to spark breakthrough success. And I do that through one-to-one leadership coaching, group coaching, uh, soft skills training seminars, uh, off-site retreats where we bond and uh, do strategic planning, I've written a few little books uh, on the radio, and like I said, I have a couple podcasts. That's awesome. I just saw your new logo, like the sign you have in your office. It looks really cool. <laughs> and Thank I, you. And just a recap for everyone who's listening, who's, who maybe heard your previous episode, you, you've you been on the show before, yes. but your your title was different. Wasn't it the time time blocking coach or what was that? Oh, the calendar coach. Yeah, the I was trying coach. to brand as that. And, and it I'm turned s- into growing forward services. <sighs> yeah. Because that wasn't the thing then, right? Well, it still was the business, but I was trying to brand, you know, as the calendar coach. Yeah. And even though I still love talking about time management on, on podcasts all over the place, I don't know if that's the, the route I want to go. Did you feel like you were hitting a dead end? I did because it's like people don't want to buy time management stuff. <laughs> they It's all self-discipline, right? And give right. them the, t- the tips and tricks, but it's like at the end of the day, they have to still implement this stuff. Yeah. So I don't know if people are going to want to buy programs with time management not unless it's like technology or tools that they can Maybe. plug in that yeah. automate their time management <laughs> right right but, but that's still, not really feasible they still have to honor their block time <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool so we're gonna go through a few different topics today but i want to talk to you about your podcast which is the what's the name of your podcast? grow forward today Grow Forward Today, and you also have your other one. Right, the local one called the Tri-Cities Influencer. In the, uh, we're in the southeast corner of Washington, Tri-Cities, Washington. So that yeah. one's been going on for about 100 episodes. Yep. Your other one's newer. What are you, around 20? 23, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I saw you had posted a clip of you being on the news for <laughs> for the, the one that's been on for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, local gal. Uh, she just moved back to Kentucky, but her name was Madeline. Madeline motivates, and she, every Tuesday morning she would do a little radio uh, spot on something motivational. Mm-hmm. So I got to be on there like four times, you know, in the last couple of years. And she really wanted to highlight the podcast. So that was an that's, honor. That's pretty cool. Mm. What uh, what did that do for your podcast? Did it help grow it or get more exposure? I don't know. I got to check the numbers again. Yeah, <clears throat> nothing nothing huge, right? <laughs> What has podcasting done for your business, though, and how do you use it to grow forward? Yeah, so I've made some really great contacts. Yeah. Well, the the theme of the podcast is personal leadership development. So uh, whatever guest I have on, like you, we're on one of my very first episodes. Uh, we talk, try to niche into one area of personal leadership development, sort of keep that the theme. Talk about the guest for sure, and mm-hmm. and uh, po- uh, platform them and, and their services for for the guests. Uh, but mainly we're just trying to help the listener with one area of personal leadership development. How has it helped my business? Well, again, we're still early at 23 episodes, but uh, my goal is on the back end of it to be able to do cool things with the guests right. or get referrals from them. And uh, so, yeah, one might be in the mix. So we'll see. <laughs> That's awesome. It's hard running a podcast. So running two, I can't even imagine. <laughs> it's a grind. It really is. I don't think people realize. I think I, because the barrier to entry is has become so low mm-hmm. to get into podcasting. Like, yeah, you can buy a microphone for a hundred bucks, and you don't have to have XLR cables. You can sure. run it off of USB. But I think people look at it and go, "Oh, I'll start a podcast." And mm-hmm. I see it all the time. And I think the average is like seven episodes. Yeah. By the time a podcaster yeah. gives up, mm-hmm. so they record seven episodes. That's the average. Sometimes they're more. Sometimes less. It's really hard to break through higher levels and keep going it i mean is. we're i think this episode if i'm not mistaken is about 102 way to go yeah but mm. you know how much of a struggle that's been and there's been <laughs> more blocks of time in the last six months where i haven't been able to release them consistently because uh-huh. you yeah. get busy with business you get like changing editors and all these things just moving around yeah so with the local one i batch recording uh three per month that's it 
mm-hmm. and I release every other week. With the new one, the the national one, Grow Forward Today, it's every Friday at eleven o'clock. I record with a company called Voice America. Yeah, internet. It's like internet radio, and so it's like I got to show up because the producer is there on the call. <laughs> so you got some and pressure to get. There's pressure. I got to be there at eleven o'clock. Now I can record it on my own as well in a different time, which right. I had to do this week. Right. Uh, but, uh, usually it's, nope, gotta be there at 11. Yeah. That was different too. That was the first podcast. I haven't been on a ton of podcasts. I should probably start getting on other people's, uh, um, <laughs> but, uh, yours was the first one was like really highly produced. Mm-hmm. Like we're used to just winging it. Like, like today <laughs> I, before we start recording, I'm like, you know what? I don't really have a plan. Let's just figure out what we're going to talk about. <laughs> and, Pizza toppings. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But getting on yours, I remember you like, like, the producer was prepping me on like, okay, we're going to go for this many minutes and we're going to stop. You got a commercial break. And so you go run through that. Yep. That's probably more like what it's like on the radio. I would bet Mm -hmm. like they're really looking at the clock and knowing exactly how much time is left like a pie. (laughs) Yes. And I chose not to do the actual live, like, on the radio, yeah, you could choose that option. I chose the pre-recorded podcast, yeah, method, so it could be edited in case somebody does run long, or we've you know bleed over into a break. They can actually chop things off, or if they say something that you don't want live That's on right. the episode, <laughs> which I'm sure you don't get too much of that with. No, your... it's only happened once. Yeah, what was it? <laughs> uh, somebody got a little political. Oh, really? <laughs> and that's not the that's not the gist of my podcast, right? It's really mm-hmm. hard, to, especially like. Like on mine, there's so many different. I'm not. I haven't been super focused in one area or the other. Uh, we were just talking about that earlier that I should start kind of taking a direction with it. But it's funny how easily that kind of stuff can come up, and it's kind of hard to. Um, what am I? What's the word I'm trying to say? It's kind of hard to move past it. Like mm-hmm. I just want to kind of brush it off and go through and right. to the next thing. <laughs> and sometimes the guest doesn't want to or. Or I don't start thinking that I'm recording, so I kind of start jumping into it, and it's like, no, 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 I can't go there. Uh-huh. So what else is new with you? Hmm. How's so, the coaching yeah, business going? Yeah, I'm bumper to bumper with coaching. So, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm recording this with you on my way to vacation. So, you know, before a vacation, you just got to cram everything in. So the month of May has been just bumper to bumper clients. Yeah. So all day long coaching, training, team building. So it's doing what I love. Right. And, and on, on the given day, I could probably do a team building, a group coaching, and a coaching, and record a podcast on the same day. And it's just fun because it's like it's never the same day twice, but it is bumper to bumper. And then as an entrepreneur, then there's admin work to do mm-hmm. after work, right? Whether it's preparing for the next day or invoicing or and whatever. When you don't, those other days don't become as productive. Right. And I think your background with, <clears throat> excuse me, your background with time management helps because I, what the next question I was going to ask you is how do you fit all that stuff in your day? <clears throat> now I know how you fit it in because it's time blocking and it's, yep. it's putting it in your calendar. Otherwise sure. it doesn't exist, but a lot of people can't accomplish that many things in one day and they wonder how we're able to. Mm-hmm. Um, I've gotten really bad at it or probably over the last few months where I just haven't been dialed in with my time blocking. But man, when I am, I'm able to accomplish so much in one day. Oh, yeah. I think it can triple your productivity. I don't have any stats on that, but it was a game changer for me, the whole time blocking thing, because I block everything. I block filing, you know, date nights with my wife. I mean, reading, professional development, um, going to the gym. Everything is time blocked. Yep. So, So you might say, well, that's a little OCD, but hey, I get it all in. All the things that I want to do are all the priorities are in my schedule. Well, and let's just not even talk about work. Let's just say if you actually time block it and plan it in your calendar, it actually will happen. So if if somebody's, and I, this is a struggle of mine. This is why I think I'm probably the best person to talk about it is even though I time block, when it comes to personal stuff like vacationing and taking my kids to do things, those are the things where I'm like, I do it more on a whim. And when I have put them in my calendar and I plan ahead, I I get those things. I actually go and do those things with them. But if you don't, there's a lot of times where you go through and you go, man, I had some free time this weekend. We could have done something if we planned it, mm-hmm. but I just burned through the weekend now. We didn't take that take advantage of that time. Yeah, or it, you, your brain tries to hold in it, like, I got to do that. Like oil change, for instance. I know it's, it's stupid, right? But yeah. I let my oil change like get down to 15% oil life. 
you know, and yeah. but I've been thinking about it for two months, but I never wrote it down and yep. I never blocked it. As soon as I blocked it, I made it happen. But then I had to pay way more money because I couldn't get into my place. Right. You know, and I had to go to Jiffy Lube. So, <laughs> so you change oil or you just add to it? <laughs> oh, changing the oil. I yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. Some people just top it off all the time and <laughs> call it good. <laughs> so, what specifically do you have an industry that you coach people, or is it? Is it all walks of life, different industries, different businesses? It is different industries, different businesses, but it's primarily leadership. So my ideal client is a team leader, someone who's supervising people. Yeah. And I, I feel like that's where I can add the most value from my background, but also I just love leadership. I love reading about it. I read 52 books a year, and I would say half of those are on leadership and half are on personal growth. I know it sounds like a nerd, but I think it's fun. You know, people would say like, well, you don't you read it. for fun? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> fiction? Like, no, <laughs> not fiction. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So around reading, do you, you read, actual read physical books, 52 a year? Or half, do you listen? half and half. Uh, half half and uh, half. Audible or my local library has uh, an app on mm -hmm. the phone that you can use and just get free audiobooks to listen to. Yeah. Uh, I also listen to, actually, half, half, a third, third, third. The other third is CDs in the car. So I use my travel time to listen to audiobooks. Okay. <clears throat> The uh, Audible, I have Audible, and I've you know had subscriptions on and off. You can pause it, but it's actually such a good platform. It is because you get credits every month, mm -hmm. and you can t usually a book costs one credit. Yep. Um, but my struggle is actually physically reading books and having like it's not the act of reading; it's just that I'm a slow reader. Mm -hmm. Even though we can read faster, you know, and comprehend it, I'm one of those people that reads slow, and I just feel like it takes me just absolutely forever mm. to read a book where audio i can turn it on like what's you can speed up the you can right you can speed up the audio so you yeah. can listen to it a little quicker but i'm at about 1.45 on the uh, speed up thing <laughs> you've got it dialed <laughs> yeah That's funny. i mean any faster than that i just start getting a little panicky right and any slower it's like come on so for people who haven't listened to your previous episode why don't we go through your background a little bit so that they know what your background is in coaching so all the way down to you being an assistant. Was an assistant principal or were you the, the main principal for uh, school? Started as assistant and then, yeah, became actual elementary principal. Because I feel like the last time we talked, that was really a big factor in you, you know, yeah, leading people. Yeah, yeah I started as a fifth grade teacher. That was right out of college mm. uh, down in uh, Simi Valley, California. And uh, did that for two years. And then my principal saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and that was leadership. I uh, never even thought about the word leadership or anything about it at that point, at like 23 years old. And then he said, would you be my vice principal next year? It was private school. Um, and 23. 23. Uh, so on my 24th birthday, I think, or the week after that, I became a vice principal for half day and I was PE teacher the other half because I couldn't afford a full-time salary for that. So I would come in a suit in the morning and then I would change into gym clothes at lunch and lead PE for the third through sixth graders for the rest of the day. That's cool. <laughs> so that was fun. Did that for two years. Went through an earthquake uh, there in Northridge in 1994. You were and, there for that? Uh, yep. And uh, got married that year and we said, we're out of here. You know, be between that and the smog and the traffic and the lack of family values and yeah, the, uh, yeah everything. It was just like, we're out of here. So then you were we feeling that then. I mean, imagine where oh, it's at now. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. So then um, my wife was from uh, Kent, Washington, okay. uh, Seattle area, if you don't know the geographics of that. And I didn't want the rain of Seattle. They said the east side is totally different. I'm like, ha, ha, how can it be? How can one state be so different? Right. Well, there's this mountain range that divides the state and sort of shields the rain. So I just mailed resumes to the private schools on the east side and uh, in the Tri-Cities. A uh, school picked me up, said, we need you right now to be our vice principal sixth grade teacher. So we moved, and uh, the very next, uh, the end of that year, they said, would you consider being the elementary principal? Because the school is growing by leaps and bounds, and the, the head guy would become the superintendent, and then we would hire an elementary and a secondary principal. Would you be that? At 26 years old, I was like, uh, if you think I could do it, sure. And they said, yeah. well, we'll pay for you to get your master's degree. I'm like, well, then I'm in. <laughs> right. So that's what got me into being a principal. So this next question is, I think, going to relate to specifically what you dealt with then, but actually leaders who are younger, 
how did you deal with people who are maybe older than you, teachers, looking at you in a leadership position at an age at 24 to 26 years old? Yeah, everybody was older than me. I mean, the teachers were older, the rest of the administration, the parents were older. I didn't have a child Most of them probably time. had kids you were in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not quite like that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was definitely, teachers. yeah, it was, it was definitely uh, feeling like the youngest guy in the room. Yeah. But I had this like indefatigable, I love that word, uh, enthusiasm. Like, I just wanted to be the best school on the planet. And yeah. I just loved the kids. And it was just like, I played with them at recess. I remember spraining my ankle playing freeze tag with them. I had a, I have a puppet, an eagle puppet that I'd bring to assemblies. Um, I just loved being with the students. But when it came to interacting with, like, staff, uh, then it was like, okay, they're like, who is this young kid? Like, go back to your office and do your principal thing. Like, we're just, we just want to be in our four walls right. with our students. And I had to learn different personality styles. I had to learn management styles. Um, yeah, that's where my first conflicts in life were pretty big, you know, like mm-hmm. having to let a teacher go. That really wrecked me, you know, having to like fire my first person. So, yeah, it was tough. Well, what do you think you did to gain respect from those people who maybe looked at you as just a younger kid? Uh, relationship building. I, yeah. I literally would go after school. Uh, I would walk into, I would start at the end of the hallway, you know, and just interact with that teacher. How's it going? Anything I can do to help? Get to know them. Move to the next room. And Coming after, from value. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so just a lot of relationship building, a lot of um, affirmation, recognition. I'm just huge on praise. And so any way I could develop a new recognition system for the staff or the students, so I just try to make this real positive atmosphere. Right. No, I think that's really cool. I think that uh, we're heading in a direction, and maybe it was like this before, but I feel like I'm seeing younger and younger people become leaders of organizations, yeah. creating big companies. I mean, now that we have, you know, everything with the internet, I mean, you can do, you can just do anything, right? And so you're seeing younger kids get into these roles where maybe they're hiring employees. I see it in, even in real estate teams where younger kids and I shouldn't say kids, right? Young adults, <laughs> young adults are starting to build build organizations, but maybe having people who are older than them in their world, it, it sometimes I think is hard to gain gain that respect from them because people just kind of brush it off like, oh, you're younger. Yeah, and I now I'm on the other side of that. And I'm trying to start groups that help young professionals succeed. So I just started a group last week. Uh, calling it the Young Leaders Success. I also have a group called Leader Launcher. And so those two groups, one is uh, just professional development, a two-hour seminar on soft skills once a month. So they get to hang around with some other people that are in different industries and just trying to give them 12 leadership proficiencies in the course of a year. And then this one I started last week is young CEOs or people on their way up wanting to get promoted, and it's like a mastermind group for them. And uh, now I just want to give back because when I was in that chair, I would have loved to have a group like that. Mm -hmm. So what do they consist of? Other leadership or other people in leadership positions that kind of collaborate with each other? Or do you guys have like a structure around what's happening in those masterminds? Um, So the structure of the mastermind is a check-in. It's probably an icebreaker. And then like a check-in of how are you doing physically, mentally, with your business, with your family, and your personal growth on a scale of one to 10. Mm-hmm. So then you tell a little narrative of how your last month went in those five areas. Uh, then we will talk about, uh, everyone's gonna bring like a hot topic just for 10 minutes. So you're in the hot seat for 10 minutes. What's something I can help you with? We all peer coach each other. So that's super fun to watch, by the way, You know, to see people coach each other. Right. So I don't have to be the expert in the room. Um, I'll just add value whenever I can. Um, then there is usually a business leadership topic where everybody uh, brings either their own, what they're doing, or researches it. And then okay. I, I also add value to that. And then they do goal setting at the end. So usually three business goals and one personal goal. And then we keep each other accountable month to month. And is this, this is all in person? <clears throat> in person. That's cool. Yeah. 95% of my work is there uh, in the Tri-Cities. Do you have anyone that travels? To the group? Yeah. No. They're, no. All, they're all right there. So it's very convenient for everyone. Right. Well, if you're in the Tri-Cities and you're listening to this, <laughs> reach out to Paul. <laughs> yes. What I think you, what I've always enjoyed about talking with you, though, is how passionate you are about helping people and creating these systems and, you know, all of everything about your coaching. Um, what I think you should do 
is put something like that together online. And you'd started to do something along those lines, didn't you, last time we talked? I wanted to do an online subscription service for right. um, called Bullseye for team leaders and just didn't have people biting at it. So it's sometimes an entrepreneur, you look at stuff and like, okay, that didn't work. Not quite sure why. Um, I don't know if people didn't want to pay monthly or there wasn't a value or the topic was too obscure. You know, you sort of have to do a post-mortem on what doesn't work. But that would be the goal because I would like some more passive income mm -hmm. because, like I said, I'm bumper to bumper with one-to-one -one coaching right. most of the time. And uh, so I'm, I think I'm going to pivot to the uh, online course development, and that's probably a way I could do that. Yeah, kind of creating content that's evergreen, helping people, evergreen, and right. updating things. Mm -hmm. You know, the bullseye thing, I remember you and I discussed it. What I struggle with as an entrepreneur or business owner is that I – I just had, I feel like I'm always just bombarded with different things. Yeah. There's, there's so many, like just when it comes down to email, right? Mm -hmm. This is, you'll probably give me a hard time because of time blocking. If I time blocked better on those things, I would do it. <laughs> but uh, it's just really hard to keep up with so many different things. It is. And it's like, how much stuff do you take on, right? How much stuff do you start going down a path towards? Now, I think when people get to a point where, it's either going to be caused by pain or pleasure. And if yes. it's pain of lack of growth or, cause I don't remember exactly what the bullseye thing was, but I, for leaders it was about growth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So trying to give actual tools like uh, performance development plans and um, you know, how to have a crucial conversation with somebody like actual tools. I had video, audio, um, guest appearances, you know, on video. I just wanted to like surround them with like all this relevant stuff that they wouldn't have to go find it. It would be curated all for them right in front of them. So that was the goal of that. But the lack of accountability mm. of some person saying, do yeah. this. Yeah, I think I think the, the trend is still people want a live person. Yeah. You know, I don't think AI is ever gonna replace a live coach that is coming alongside you and saying, how can I help you? And giving you real time feedback, mirroring back to you, you know, yourself and saying, Have you tried this? Asking you the tough questions. Mm -hmm. So and of course that's that's what I enjoy doing the most. So it's gonna be hard to make that that pivot, I think, to something more passive. Yeah. Unless you do more group masterminds online. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I don't I don't mind becoming the small groups guy because I've uh, coming from the church world, uh, small groups are really powerful for people getting to know each other and feeling belonging. Mm. And I think anytime you're in a group where you're like, I like these people, you know, and I can't wait to meet with them and they're adding value to my life and I'm adding value to their life. That's, that's awesome. So I've got, I've got a few groups that are like I described to you. And then I've got some team coaching that is also just as fulfilling. What do you think the biggest struggle for the people you coach is? I know there's so many different things, right? That's yeah. a blanket statement. But if you had to pinpoint one, maybe two, what are the things that you see can people consistently struggle with throughout their business, personal life? Yeah, and it's it's time management number one because they have they have too many, too many priorities that they think are urgent, mm -hmm. and uh, they're not getting to the important ones. So they're feeling guilty that they can't keep up with maybe their self care or their family life or. Some of their bigger projects keep getting pushed or kicked to the curb because there's all these fires to put out in front of them. And their to-do list just keeps growing instead of shrinking. And uh, that's very frustrating for most leaders because it's just like, ah. And sometimes it really is. They have too much work to do. Like it needs to be delegated, offloaded, because there's just not enough hours in the day for them to get it done. So it's hard to help people evaluate like, okay, is it just too much work or are you not using your time wisely mm -hmm. by not time blocking and so forth? So that's a big one. Conflict is probably number two. Everybody um, that I is has a relationship in their life that's sticky and um, they all are probably not dealing with that one situation as well as they want to. Right. And they need that feedback, that objective feedback from a coach to be able to say, am I silly here or am I, do I have something? 99% of the time I'm like, gosh, you should have talked about this a long time ago. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're- And when you're, you're talking about this, it's, it's like employees, maybe yes. different employees business. Employees or colleagues, yeah. Yeah, or the difficult customer or, yeah, there's, uh, uh, it could even be a family member that's causing them havoc. They got, right. the, they got on the drama train with them and now they're, way down the road and they just haven't put up a boundary. 
So um, that's always relevant, I think, conflict. So my, my latest book is uh, Leading Through the Dark Waters of Conflict, and I wrote it because I think it's applicable to everybody. And where is that available? Uh, it's off my website, growingforwardservices.net. Okay. Do you have an audio version yet? Not yet. I've got audio of the other ones, but not that one yet. Cool. I'll have to check that out. We'll put all the links, too, just for all your stuff and inside the Super. show notes for everyone listening. Thank you. Um, I want to st- step back just a little bit. So the first one you said was basically um, priorities, right? Yep. Figuring out priorities. Do they have too many priorities or if it's too much work? How do you help people sort through those priorities? Because it it, it, it can be a struggle, right? The, you Sometimes we put all these things kind of at the same level, thinking that they're all... Mm-hmm. of same of the same importance to get done yeah how do you sort through that to kind of help people yeah the first tool i give them it's just it's called, called priority ranking it's probably an old stephen covey uh technique where you put all your tasks in one column the next column you put the urgent and you give it a scale of one to ten that task the important a scale of one to ten on that task you multiply those two together and get a score so it could like manage email could be a task and you might go oh, it's like a four on urgency, there might be a couple in there that I have to deal with, but other than that, eh. importance, you know, to the success of my job, eh, maybe a five. So four times five is 20. So that, that, so that task is a 20. Someone else might be, um, you know, I've got a report to my boss and that's like, okay, well, he, he needs to know what I'm doing. So that's like a nine because I have to get that done by Friday. And the urgency is like, if I don't do that, I'm going to get in trouble. That could be a nine. Well, that one's got an 81 score. So after you go through your tasks, um, you're going to re-rank that by order priority. And it shows that not everything is equal in your priority. I mean, the numbers will show unless you give everything a 10 and a 10, then of course the whole exercise Doesn't is work. worthless. Yeah. yeah. So then I have to help them really like wrestle with, okay, they all can't be equal importance, which one really is more important. So not that you're going to do that every day because that would be exhausting to come up with that list and do that. But if you do it a couple of times, your brain starts figuring that out and you start ranking them. Well, if there are things that are repetitive that you do on a normal basis that maybe you're spending too much time in certain areas that might help, right? Yep. Like if you sit there all day long and you just refresh your email and you're going through and checking it. Oh, yeah. You know, instead of just dedicating 15, 20 minutes at the end of the day or the end of the day or... Right. So that brings up another point is also helping people track their time. If they're willing to go through the effort of doing a time task analysis Mm -hmm. and every 30 or every 15 minutes you're writing down what you do for two weeks, um, boy, that tells a story. It really does. And you're like, wow, I've squirreled away time on that. And boy, I've had too many crises. I might have to get ahead of that. And it's just amazing how uh, that reveals how you're spending your time. Yeah. That is crazy. It, just realizing how much time we can waste. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, well, I was talking to Matt the other day about social media and how it's easy to sit down sometimes and not pay attention. And all of a sudden, <laughs> 30 minutes have gone by. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that was a waste. Yeah. Yeah, literally, I will tell people that are addicted to social media or email to get the old egg timer, you know, uh, and dings after a allotted amount of time, and then you're done. Right. And that ding is sort of wakes you up and go, oh, okay, no more wasting time. Back to work. And literally, like Brian Tracy would say, say out loud, back to work to get your brain, like, you know, back engaged. Right. And like shutting that one off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then jumping forward to the conflict resolutions. How do you, I mean, I know you have your book out, but how do you coach people through some of those things? What, like in a little bit more depth, what do you do to help people, uh, whether they have to fire somebody, whether they have to deal with uncomfortable situations, what are some tactics or tools that you help them with? Yeah, I, I want to help them frame the conversation. So I've got to ask them a bunch of questions to sort of get the gist of it. <clears throat> And I don't ever get to hear the other side. So uh, I'm just going on what they've said and where the pain point is for them, how it's affecting them or the team or the culture. And once I can get to that, I'm like, okay, I think I've got the the gist. Let's frame the conversation. What do you what do you want at the end of this conversation? Well, I want us to be in more harmony together. I want this person to stop being late or whatever the issue is. Okay, good. That that's our destination. So now we're gonna back into that with we're gonna talk about um Oh, you know, we're going to we're going to say we're going to start with something like frame it in a way that we want to be helpful. So one one author who wrote um, Conflict Without Casualties, which is another book recommend, 
He says, use the ORPO uh, acronym. Sounds like a dog food, but ORPO stands <laughs> for open. So you start open by saying, hey, Andy, you know, um, we've been having a little tension. You know, we're not getting along quite as well as we are. We are and uh, uh, I, I would just like to get us together today to brainstorm some solutions. So you start pretty open and you just keep going. R is resourceful. So I know by us putting our heads together, we're going to figure this out. And we're by the end of this conversation, I think we're going to probably get a strategy for that. You keep going persistent. Persistent means like, and, you know, after we're done with this conversation, I'm going to check in with you so we can make sure are we still cool, you know, with this, or are you, you know, rising to the expectation that I've got? Mm -hmm. And then you end with open again, which is like, so what do you think about that? Are we good for a conversation today? And if you just keep going, the average emotionally healthy person will just go with you on that journey because it's the hardest thing is getting into the conversation. So I'll help them frame the getting into it using that ORPO. Um, and then I'll, then I'll talk about like, what are the main issues until that person leaves our coaching session feeling like, okay, I feel like I know what I'm going to say. These are usually they're writing down like their big three things that they want to communicate. And then uh, that's time well spent. If it takes a whole hour just to frame that conversation, that was a good coaching session. That's cool. But it comes in with a logical approach instead of emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And since I'm not wrapped into it. Yeah. Well, I think that's hard mm -hmm. too, because if you're in a position where maybe you're upset that, you know, you're emotionally upset that something's been going on over and over, what whatever that might be. Yeah. Going into that conversation, and I've made that mistake before, going into it maybe heated or irritated about it instead of having more of a plan. Uh so I like oh, that yeah. approach. Yeah. I mean, we lose 15 IQ points when we're angry. So we literally get stupider. <laughs> so that's my able... problem. That's <laughs> my problem. got to get back to the frontal lobe. <laughs> You're back in the lizard brain. <laughs> right. Um, I just drew a blank where I was going with this, but yeah. Conflict. Conflict. <laughs> um, man, I had it. Well, what's another thing that's interesting is that, you know, when people will go like, "Am I, am I, am I overreacting, Paul?" When right. they when they tell the story, and as I mentioned earlier, ninety nine percent of the time I'll go like, "No, like, why haven't you brought this up earlier?" And even though I I like helping people mediate conflict, um, I remember when I was leading, and I remember letting an employee walk all over me, mm -hmm. and then going to the HR department and uh of the nonprofit and saying this employee is doing this and this and this and they just looked at me like they need to be on a performance improvement plan what the heck are you thinking why are you not dealing with that issue and it was like wow i'm, I'm in the fishbowl right i'm discovering water <laughs> for the last right. i'm the last person to discover water uh so it's helpful to have that objective source to help you sort things out and do you do you find that like people who are consistently having problems over and over uh, let's just say you have a leader that's dealing with an employee that's continuously having issues. At what point do you help them make the transition of like, hey, maybe this isn't a good fit for your team? Yeah, and obviously I'm not in their system, so I can't recommend that. But I'll, but I will ask the question like, how long are you willing to put up with this? You know, mm -hmm. I'll ask some type of questions that'll be like, so you're cool with dealing with this again? <laughs> sort of like leading the witness, but trying not to be just like. Usually they come to that uh, realization like this is taking so much of my energy. I'm losing full days dealing with this employee over and over again. So right. that's when I'm going to encourage them to develop a performance improvement plan to give that person like one last chance. Spell out your expectations in writing, present it to that person, um, have a dialogue about it, schedule checkpoints with them. And then if it doesn't work you can at least rest at night thinking like I went the extra mile to figure that out. Right. So I remember the question that I was going to ask you a little bit ago that <laughs> Welcome back, Andy. popped back in my head. <laughs> when um, when you deal with leaders, entrepreneurs, um, a lot of people I think don't think they need coaching, mm -hmm. right? Or let's say they do. Let's say that somebody wants a coach, but there's a lot of people who maybe aren't in a position to hire a coach because they, I don't know what you charge, but... I've seen coaching can go really expensive sure. through the roof. What would you say to people like that that maybe need a coach, don't know how they can afford one, or don't know that they tr really need one in their in their business? Yeah, all great performance performers need a need a coach, mm -hmm. and great performance requires mastery, and we get to mastery through feedback. So if you think about that, it's like all right, so I've got to have more feedback in my life. 
And if I've got an objective source of somebody that's hanging around other business leaders and industry leaders, maybe that person has some insight that they could bring to bear on my situation. So if you think like you know it all and you don't need a coach, I'd be a little worried about you because mm -hmm. you're not being a model of teachability and coachability for your More people. Of a fixed mindset then. Yeah. Yeah. And so your people are only going to grow to that level that you're at and it's just going to stop. They're not going to bust through the roof because if you keep gunning for growth, then now you're, you've opened up the whole organization to be a learning organization. Right. So if I tell my people that I have a coach, then they'll be like, whoa, <clears throat> I think my leader's pretty awesome. They've got a coach. Like, so they're, they're going to the next level. Maybe I need a coach. And so it becomes this contagious thing that we just do. Yeah. Well, and, and the people who are going to grow with you are going to follow, or the people who want to just stay where they're at are, are typically going to drop off then. Yeah, they'll stand out. But I think it's just one of those things. It's it's something that you know we've been looking into for our business. and But I think it's hard, right, when I talk to other people and they go, oh, you don't need coaching. Hmm. Or, or I've talked to people who know that maybe they need coaching in their business, uh, but don't want to spend the money on coaching. Yeah. So the return in, on investment is difficult to quantify with coaching, right? right? And that's a struggle that... You know, someone might have and say, like, I don't I don't know, is this saving me time, money, energy, right? It probably is, but how do we put numbers to that? Right. So that I can see why that's a common complaint is because it's not like it's affecting my bottom line tomorrow. But who knows that because I helped you transition that employee out <laughs> in that conversation, um, uh, now you've gotten all this time back. And if I wouldn't have been your coach at that moment in time, you might have hung on with that person for too long. And you know what I mean? It's just it's hard to quantify that. But you could see how it's like, oh, I'm so good. I got a coach because I had a person I could bounce that off of. And now my life is way better. And right. some people literally transfer jobs as a result of coaching because they just realize that it's not going with their core values. Gets, I mean, you get clarity um, around what you're, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, again, hard to measure. But. You know what I would say is like just try it. If if you're debating coaching and you're looking at that dollar figure and going, man, what do I get for that? You know, try it and and see how it goes. You don't have to stay with that coach forever, right? You know, if you're not getting um, anything noticeable out of that, I would just say try try somebody else. And I think that correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the coach will help determine in the beginning what areas that person's struggling in, and if they're not a good fit. Most of the time, that coach is not going to sit there and coach them to whatever the person needs if it's not something you can help with, correct? Yeah, you've got to make a coaching agreement at the beginning. Like, okay, let's maybe do some assessments. I love assessments. I think I have a assessment I don't like because <laughs> really? it's like little little MRI slices of your life. Like this one's saying how I respond to expectation. This one's on how my personality is, and this one's on my time management. Yeah. So those, those are fun. So by doing those assessments with people, uh, it reveals – chinks in the armor you know places like that and when people see that about themselves like can you help me with that i'm like yes i actually i can help you with that so um it can bring them a, either their low get over the low bar or really take them to the next level mm -hmm. i just did a big assessment the other day we we do different assessments at kw so there's like a kp kpa and then do the disc assessment the pro yep. you know personality profile mm -hmm. but uh it's funny i did this kpa and it's a kind of a lengthy one you'd go through the whole thing it's about 40 minutes to do the assessment then you get the results back yep. um, and it's really tailored around like real estate and then it kind of gives you breakdowns of jobs that you might be good like positions different things you might be good at um, but it really shows like in depth in certain areas where you score high where you score low and then what they what you're supposed to do is sit down with one of the leadership and yeah they validate it mm -hmm. so you go through and you you know talk about it but it's really eye-opening to read about yourself in that way that's maybe a little bit more revealing, right? You, you ask, you're answering all these questions that don't make sense at the time, mm -hmm. but it spits out kind of an answer. And it's funny, like, how accurate a lot of that is. Yeah. And then you need someone, whether it's your leader or a coach, to then walk you through, like, what can, how can we turn this into an action plan, yeah. right? Coaching is all about action. If there's no life change happening, coaching isn't happening, in my opinion. Right. So um, if, if you don't have someone that's turning that into an action plan with you and then walking alongside you as you implement it, you're just alone when you get that assessment. And you're like, all right, I'm either going to do something with this or I'm not. You know, And odds yep. are you're probably not going to do much with it unless you're a real driven person.
Right. Because you're just going to look at it and go, oh, okay. <laughs> set it off to the side on your desk and not do much. Move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah. So what is, what's the goal? What do you want to achieve moving forward? How big do you want to see your business grow? What are your mm. future plans? That's a great question. Uh, so I joined a national mastermind group uh, just last month. And so we're going to San Diego uh, in a week so, uh, to, so I can meet the rest of the group when live. When you say national, is it like an online group that you... It's an online group. So we meet twice a month on Zoom. And then we meet three times a year in person. So this will be... I've only met with them twice online. And this will be my first in person. So they're a group already and I'm joining them. So uh, I'll have to... Uh, you know, raise my introvert game a little bit. <laughs> How do you find stuff like this, real quick? Uh, through a recommendation of a friend of a friend. Okay. So yeah, so I, I have a another speaker friend who is getting coaching, and then he said, uh, "Boy, they have another facet of their business uh, that's a uh, sort of high high level mastermind group of people that make a hundred thousand or more. Like that's the minimum in order to be in the group. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you'd be great for that. So then they vetted me and." you know, see if I was a fit for their group. But I was looking for a long time and I, I couldn't find one. Really? Yeah, I just threw it out into the ethernet, you know, like, hey, anybody know about a high level mastermind group? Chirp, chirp, chirp. Uh, didn't, didn't hear anything. So it was great to, you know, again, relationship building opens, opens doors, right? So yet, yet another way that a door was open for me. That's so awesome. um, to answer your question, so I'm, I'm going to utilize that mastermind group to take my business to the next level. Like I want them to challenge me. I want them to pull, poke at things like that doesn't make sense that you're doing that, Paul. Or boy, I think if you just did a little pivot here and you went this direction, um, you'd get way more time back for yourself. So I'm eager to go into the second half of this year because I think there's going to be those ahas. I'm also taking a sabbatical month in July. So 30 days without clients. I think I can do it. It's going to be though. hard. It's going to be hard. They say it's you got to let the soul catch up to the body. <laughs> so that's that's the it's goal. It's good to kind of take a break, though. I mean, because you I get know. so caught up in the doing that you don't, you yeah. just don't live. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there'll be insights in solitude that I will get that I, through the rat race, just don't come to me. So I don't know the answer fully to your question yet. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's funny, though. As you were talking about, you know, catching up, basically taking a 30 day break. Mm -hmm. The times when I have kind of backed off and really started like not pushing as hard, or, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but basically when I've had more free time and maybe boredom, I, I have a lot more ideas come to me. Sure. Improvements on my business, new ways that we can reach more people or marketing. Um, but that's kind of the process, right? You got to be able to kind of step back from the busyness. Yeah. And then allow yourself to just come up with different ideas and solutions. Yeah, breakthroughs happen in solitude. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, if you would ask me, like, what's a third thing that leaders struggle with? They don't have time to think, dream, plan, yeah. reflect, and they just put their head down and go into the next day. So we've got to build that in. And this month, I'm breaking my own rules. Like, I, I scheduled a think day. I blocked it and I just ran right over top of it with five clients, you know, instead of taking that time. And I feel a little bit of anxiety, like I didn't take that time. So I'm not sure if I've planned the next month as well. Right. So I'm just being real. Or if it's people like me that interrupt your vacation time to come <laughs> stop in and record a podcast. You're on the way. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny though. It's been about, well, I want to say close to a year since... Yeah, uh, I think it was since September last year, right? Or end of August. What I think is cool, just kind of jump back into the podcasting relationship building is I met you online through, we did a Zoom podcast. Yeah. I think you were on my podcast originally. Yep. And then... Once we realized how close you were, you know, in physical yeah. locations, on your way up to Sandpoint, you would stop by. <laughs> yep. Met you in person, had a good long talk. Yep. You know, it was a great conversation. And I said, well, next time you stop by, let's do a podcast. So <laughs> I remembered that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. Yep. So we're getting close to wrapping up. But before that, I wanted to kind of recap on some of the books that you've written in case they will reach people, um, help them in whatever journey they're in, where they can find them, and then what's the best social media platforms that people can find you on. Yes. So again, my website is growingforwardservices.net. Okay. You just go to the store and that the books will be there. So I write little books, you know, they're still books. You know, it still takes an effort to do it, cool. but you could read them in an hour and a half. Uh, maximizing every minute is the time management one where I've just poured all the things that I've tried into one book. 
Um, then I've got uh, the static cling principle was the very first one I wrote. And that one was what to habits and mindsets to pull off of your life which caused a little bit of a spark when you pull them off. <laughs> and then uh, what you need to adhere to your life for success. Uh, that's a real easy read and good for everybody. Then a, a leadership series of leading the team you've always wanted, inspirational traits for bonding your team together, um, leading with super vision. So it's how to cast vision and uh, how to craft it, cast it, and carry it. And then leading through the dark waters of conflict is the one that I just read. I feel like I need to just go buy all of them. You do, you do, you do. They're not very expensive either. Cause <laughs> and they're all on your website. They're all on my website. Yes, I'm, there's probably some on Amazon as well, but my website's probably the easiest way to do that. Okay. And then social media, yeah, I'm pretty much on all the socials, Growing Forward Services on Facebook, on Instagram, Paul D. Casey on LinkedIn uh, are probably the best ways to get to, get to me. I probably should start TikTok. I haven't yet. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm going to get scolded. <laughs> Well, hey, man, it's been a pleasure having you back on. Um, I'm always excited to talk to you about just goal setting and stuff. Because yeah, it's, uh, stuff. It, there's just uh, There's not a lot of people in the world that are that passionate about just helping people achieve those those things. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Keep yeah. growing forward. Yeah. And thanks for taking the time before your vacation. Is about you. yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening. Uh, be sure to check this out on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. See you on the next one. Did you find what you were looking for? I've got some work to do. Did you find what you were looking for? I've got some work to do.